News Presentation. leadership crisis in South Africa? That's the question we're asking tonight on Interface. Good evening to you. My name is Tembi Samakhele. You may have been following the recent criticism of political leadership in the country by Nedbank chairman Roel Kosa. The issue has escalated to a debate among South Africans with government and the ANC berating Kosa on a personal level and business leaders coming to his defense. Now, I spoke to Professor Chris Malikane, the economics lecturer at Wirtz University, and Paul Graham, executive director at IDAS about the real issues behind the leadership squabble. Do we have a leadership crisis in South Africa? Paul? Yes, we do. It's not a problem that people debate, and they should. That We all agree that uh, it was Mr. Causa's right to say what he said, saying he's right to disagree with him. But the manner of that debate just does seem to me to be a little bit um, at odds with what we need at the moment. In fact, I want us to talk about that relationship between government and the private sector a little bit later. But, Prof, Dr. Causa speaks of a strange breed of political leadership in the country. Do you agree with that statement? Well, uh, I don't agree with that statement because the question that you need to ask is, is since when did the leadership becomes, became, become strange? Mm. Because uh, it's not long ago since we had a, a, a change in administration in 2009. So you need to specify uh, which, when exactly did South Africa become strange. So let's say he's, he's talking about the current leadership since 2009. Well, if you look back, the current leadership actually uh, has been involved in leadership uh, roles uh, since, uh, in fact, uh, the 1950s, others, 1960s. So the question is, what exactly did he expect this leadership to perform? In my view, the whole question really can be looked at from different uh, mm -hmm. class perspectives. Uh, others would say that uh, because of the current dispensation, uh, this leadership is quite good because uh, they are making good business and others who have suffered because of the change in administration might feel uh, a, a sense of grief but how do you say something like that? This is the chairperson of a, one of the big four banks. What does he have to gain or lose by making such a statement? You must recall that uh, in, in the past uh, 18 years, uh, the policies that have been followed by the past administrations have been in favor of the, the financial sector. Okay. Uh, uh, and, and they defended uh, fervently uh, the property rights. But when you look at the current administration, the current leadership of the ANC, it's even open to begin talking about the question of property relations in South Africa. That this openness to even begin to review the decisions of the Constitutional Court and the property clause in the Constitution is what is actually agitating uh, people like uh, Dr. Dr. Koza, as he puts it in his, in his blog. Mr. Graham, if we we'll move beyond the, the, the personality issues and, and all of the, the bashing, uh, in this discussion and we look at what is really at the core of what's being discussed here. What are the leadership issues that we're really dealing with at the moment? Look, perhaps this, this question of, of where you stand and how you view leadership is definitely a problem because uh, the Afrobarometer, which is a citizen survey, um, has uh, Mr. Zuma at a 60-odd percent approval rating amongst the general population of this country, very high levels of trust in his leadership. But there's no doubt that in certain circles, there, there are worries about um, the, the manner in which he exercises leadership, the choices he makes about, in particular, security sector leadership. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the question for Mr. Causa might be driven by nervousness amongst capital about certain policies, but it also seems to be driven about nervousness in relation to a, a review of the constitutional court, which is not about uh, the property rights. That's a constitutional review. This is about the manner in which the Supreme Court of our country relates to government and, uh, and which is the primary 
holder of the constitution. And I think people do worry about that. So, But also um, the fact that yeah. it, it's not just him that's saying this. We've had business leaders coming out defending him and saying, actually, there is a problem here. So what issues should we be addressing from their perspective, do you think? There, there's, there's definitely a problem of communication. I think there's... Um, the, it's true. I think some people had more of an ear of previous presidents than they might have of this president. Um, it's true there's been a, a, a conflict within business leadership itself in general. Mm -hmm. um, but I do also think that, um, that different parts of government are not always speaking with the same voice or relating to, to business leadership in the same way. And that causes confusion. I'm, I can't see how people who want a level of certainty are coping very well at the moment. And, okay. and some of it's not even our problem. It's, it's driven by tensions of a more global sense. All right, Prof, what are your thoughts on what the key issues are here? In fact, uh, uh, if you read, it, read Dr. Koza's uh, blog, he puts it very clear. He says that uh, the problem is that uh, uh, it's the property. Uh, the fact that uh, this the review the intended, intended review is likely to destroy what he calls the compromise or the negotiated constitution, which as a result of the disturbance of that constitution, it might lead to what he calls racial polar, polarization. Uh -huh. But uh, despite those statements uh, that he makes in his blog, my view is that actually what he's concerned about is about the privileges that they managed to accumulate as a class in the past uh, 18 years. So in your view, this is just business having a gripe with government because they're missing out on certain opportunities. There aren't really any leadership issues that we should be addressing. That's one. But two, the fear that the review of the constitution might have uh, certain property relations implications. Because, for example, if you allow a situation where there's a debate about nationalization, about the land question, and he raises the land issue sharply in his letter, uh, then he says you run the risk of polarizing the country along, along racial lines as if the current situation is not, is not uh, untenable. Just before we go to break, I want to just quote from uh, his letter. He speaks of a degeneration of the moral quotient in the political leadership of the country. But if you look at what's happened in business as well, you know, some of the scandals that we've seen in the business world, should this not be true then also for business? And, and it is true. People in South Africa, for the first time since we became a democracy, rate corruption as one of the big five public questions that we have to deal with. And it's been creeping up on us. That's, that's not a judgment of the actual amount of corruption, but it's a judgment of a perception of corruption, mm -hmm. which suggests that at, a, at our heart, we are becoming a country which finds it too easy to make decisions and exercise power in ways which favor one or other group of people. You know, the ANC itself is complaining about factionalism within the ANC and, and the manner in which the intelligence services and other state departments feed into that corruption. There's a fear that certain parts of the media mm. are playing different factions within the ANC. So, so there are these challenges. So just quickly before we go to break, are you saying that government is right to say to business, take the log out of your own eye first before you speak to us about moral leadership. Um, but then you must also take the moat out of your eye. You can't just point. Okay, so it goes both <laughs> ways. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. All right, we're going to take a short break. When we come back, we continue this discussion. And remember that if you would like to participate, you can go into our Facebook page and also send us your comments on SMS on 33726. Stay with us. Welcome back. You're watching Interface here on SABC3, taking a quick look at some of your Facebook messages. Janine Mayberg says, the leader should be told that their performance or behavior is not what it should be, and they should also be given guidelines on how to improve, as well as time frames in which to sort it out. And Peter Mabungu says, our leaders are wasting a lot of time 
we want results. I believe in the words of John C. Maxwell that everything rises and falls on leadership. And then Ntatlang Bukang says, our leaders should accept that they are not above criticism. The media is to blame for all of this mess. I think Tulima Donzela, Dr. Mampele Rampele, Molen Zimbeki and Professor Janssen are great leaders and even Mamutupi Motlala. So those are some of your Facebook messages. Do keep them coming and also your SMSs on the SMS line 33726. And we continue our discussion with our guest, Professor Chris Maligano, who is the economics lecturer at Wirtz University, and Paul Graham, who is the executive director at IDASA. Gentlemen, we were talking about this whole leadership issue just before the break. And then I just picked up on something that uh, Nikki Newton-King, the JSC CEO, said about the political environment in South Africa today. She says it's actually quite frustrating for investors uh, because around the world people are having serious a serious crisis of confidence in capitalism, but in South Africa, investors are seeking clarity on policy because we just can't seem to figure out who we want to be. Your thoughts? That's precisely the point, that uh, South Africa currently is in a state of flux when it comes to policy. And the reason why that is the case is because the past administration had a strong relationship with finance capital and some large corporates. But with the change in administration, then there was a certain loosening of the relationship, which makes, which creates this uncertainty that people are talking about. And yet, and uh, of course, you see that there's some policies that have be, are being pronounced that, for example, industrial policy, for an example, the role of state-owned enterprises being strengthened in the economy, develop, a, a developmental state and so forth, that is making other people uncomfortable. So the issue of uncertainty in South Africa mm. is tied to the contestation of the state within the capitalist class. Clearly you think that the status quo is what should be happening at the moment. But is it really what's good for this country? Because if you've got the CEO of the JSE saying, everywhere I go, investors are asking me the same question and I'm, I can't answer it because I don't know who South Africa or what South Africa wants to be. Look, the, the, the problem with uncertainty is that it's uncertain. So it would be better <laughs> if Good observation. it would be better if a decision was made about some of these issues, yeah. and uh, we we then moved forward. Yeah. But we are having a, a series of national debates which have been going on for quite a long time now yeah. about uh, the the manner in which the state should uh, regulate and intervene within the market. It's a different debate than it was perhaps in 19, early 90s, but at the mm. same time, it's not been concluded. Mm. And that part not, of, part of, that's part of the problem. Is that not an indictment then on the leadership? Because you can't get to a decision. You're leaving this country in a state of flux. Decide already. Who are we going to be? No, it's not a question of leadership as such. It's a question of class contestation. It means that in South Africa, the classes and have not yet resolved fundamentally the question of where this country is supposed to go. For an example, uh, COSATU has come up with its own uh, policy document of a new growth path. Government has come up with its own document, but within government, uh, there's lack of policy coherence. And if you look at that policy coherence, you'll see that it's a question of transition from the past administration policies to the new policies. However, there's, you know, it's a transitional state where it creates a flux. So in my view, I think South Africa is engaged in a situation where there's still some class contestation there's no class that is appearing to be dominating this I'm not convinced space. that, you know, that is the reason why we can't really decide on who we want to be. If the leadership knew where we were going to go, South Africa would follow. You just make a, pronounce, a pronouncement saying this is who we're going to be, this is the policy we're going to follow and follow it. But which class, which class base is going to support that type of leader? Because no leader is going to stand up uh, out alone and pronounce without having a class base to back it up. Right. But, uh, but there's, a, there's a log jam. Big business, big government, big unions. There's a log jam. Yes. But but meanwhile, there there are a myriad of other people, unemployed, poor, who are not actually represented fully at that table. I don't think. And secondly, the world is moving fast, and other parts of Africa are moving fast and making choices which are. Uh, more interesting to 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 investors, more interesting to to miners, more interesting even to to manufacturers, than us. And it's it, it's definitely having an impact in yeah. the long run on on our ability to grow to the extent that we need to grow in order to 
to do well as a country. And I don't mean do well as individual, mm. Mm. but as a country. And Speaking we, about that class, uh, Minister Natim Teto, in his response, when he was weighing in on this leadership debate, he says that the issue here is that we have racialized poverty. Yeah. And we still have the two economies in South Africa, the, the, the two nations, per se, in South Africa. And that's the reason why we have the problems that we have. It's not a leadership issue. Your thoughts? <sighs> If, if we have two nations, then it's a wealthy nation comprised of people from all racial groups and a poor nation which is predominantly black. But there's, he's saying the rich you know, is predominantly white. White capital is still controlling the money in South Africa. The, the data, the data <laughs> is uh, starting to be open to question in, in certain aspects of that. Chris? No, it's true. It's true. That teacher is correct. If you look at the mines, the dominant owners of the mines remain white people, and it's increasingly becoming foreign. Same thing with the banks. There's no black CEO amongst the top four banks, for an example. So it's a crisis 17 years down the line. But whose problem is that? Because we've got the BE legislation in place, we've got all of these things, but we're still hearing about corruption in the tender system. So you can't really say white capital is holding the money when government has opened a way for black people to go through there. No. White capital is holding the money. Uh, if you listen to the types of policies that government proposes, uh, it can be industrial policy measures to support industries, for example. It can be through some prescribed assets, a, a developmental bond. Then you'll hear find the financial sector saying, no, that is going to destroy profitability and investors are going to run away. You talk nationalization, no, there's going to be a, in a capital flight. So all these policies, progressive policies that government or some within government try to push Basically, they are met with resistance. Which... What Paul is saying is that you've got a new breed of black, rich people that are coming through. So you can't really say that the top layer is white anymore, can you? No, you can, because the top breed of black uh, uh, layer that, that, that has come through, mainly is through that we know that they got their money through the financing by the very same white capitalists. Okay, Paul, your thoughts? Well, let's talk about uh, the fact that there's a globalization of capital. So it's not only South Africans. But yeah. uh, but uh, but I think one has to accept, uh, and this is where I started, that there's a crisis of leadership because one must accept that individuals like you and I must exercise leadership where we are. And so I would expect black business leadership, people sitting on boards, even if they are there because they borrowed money to get the shares, they should be exercising leadership, and they are. You look in the parastatals, you've got people there exercising leadership. Okay. And below that, people must take a responsibility and not pass it on to someone else. All right, we'll continue this in a short while. Let's take a short break. Stay with us. Welcome back. We continue our discussion on the state of our leadership in South Africa, both on the political arena and also in business with my guest, Professor Chris Malikana, who is from Burt's University, and Paul Graham, who is the executive director at IDASA. And thank you so much for all your messages coming through on 33726. That's our SMS line and also on our Facebook page. And one of the questions coming through for you, uh, Prof, is the service delivery protest that we're seeing. Mm. Whose failed leadership is that? Well, in my view, is that you need to trace it back again. You need to be historical. When, we, when, when the ANC took over in 1994, it basically took over a gutted state, a, a resources sapped, but at the same time, it had to reconstitute a new democratic government. But within that context, you remember the, the serious limitations that government faced. They had to cut back a number of uh, public servants in 1997 and also to begin a process of retraining some of the public servants. So it's a, it was a long process, but that was occurring within the context where ideologically the role of the state in the economy was minimalist. So the crisis that we see today is an outcome of a long uh, historical process of neoliberalism, where the state was said to be not strengthened, 
Now we need the role of the state to come in to, to, to deliver quality services. The state was gutted for the past 18 years. But can you really explain that to the man on the street that's been waiting for service delivery that was promised to him almost two decades ago when the new dispensation came into place? And this person is saying, I hear what you're saying about the legacy of apartheid, but 20 years, or almost 20 years into our democracy, something should be happening. I should be getting a lot better than what I'm getting now. My leaders are failing me. It's not just a legacy of apartheid, as I said. It's a legacy of neoliberalism, which said that the state must play a minimalist role in, in the economy. So that was accompanied by the fact that the state has to be lean and mean. And now you need a very capacitated state to deliver, but you've cut the state for the past 18 years. So that is why I say, if you look at the policy of the past 18 years, there were policies that were driven by a particular class interest that did not want the state to intervene in the economy. Do That's the crisis we're sit sitting Do with. Do you buy that uh, the service delivery process that we're seeing now is because we have these lean and mean state policies? Well, the question then is, why is it not the same all over the country? But it's not. There are certain parts of, certain parts of the, the country where things are working well. There are other parts where things aren't working well. In some cases, it seems these protests are driven by the fact that people can see the development down the road, but it's not in their village. They can see what's happening in the next door place, but it's not in their village. And in other times, it's, it's because the, the research shows that the people who are protesting are also the ones who are contacting their local government, the engaged. So they're talking to municipalities, but they're not receiving feedback. Good point. No, uh, you need to understand that the apartheid government, when it developed this country, there was uneven development. If you, you say that there are certain parts of the country where things are working, you will discover that those parts of the country are parts of the country that were historical, historically resourced in the first place. So the argument that uh, uh, because of this uneven happenings of this uh, uh, so, uh, social delivery protests. Therefore, it means that the problem of neoliberalism, of a lean and mean state, are not primary, then it's a problem. But because I'm, when... I'm not... I'm not uh, you would think that it would follow the old spatial geography, but that's not entirely the case. And also, just following up on that, when can we say... Actually, now it's the time for us to say it's not apartheid, it's not neoliberalism from the past. It is actually squarely our leaders that are failing us in this. Let's <laughs> lay the blame squarely on the people that are now taking us forward. Is, At what point will we stop blaming what happened in the past? You see, the problem is that you can't separate leaders from classes. You need to, look, you need to ask yourself, what class interest is this leader representing? And the crisis of that so-called leadership is actually the, the crisis of the class that those leaders represent. So that's, that's my argument. You can't separate leaders from the social context in which they operate. Yeah, but also you can't, you, can't, you, can't, you can't just allow people to be excused on the basis of their class context. You are not and particularly if in the levels of mobility which we are seeing, people must also take some responsibility for themselves. It's not excusing leaders here. It's about looking at the weaknesses of the class and the power relations that dominate in the society. A certain class can only progress so far given the power relations. I gave an example. If you want to pursue a certain policy, there's a class that is going to say, we are going to make that policy fail because so we've got the power to do so. So that's Are we going to sit back and say, well, for as long as that's the case, nothing will happen in South Africa. We're going to see what we're seeing right now. Yes, that's, that's always going to be the case because this is a class society. There will be a perpetual contestation of power in this in the society until there's a clear emergence of a class that rules to take the country forward in a particular direction. Look, politics is about contest. Yeah. So you have to mobilize power. Citizens have to mobilize power. Protest in, in the streets is only one way to mobilize power. There's no doubt that in some cases, some, some trade unions are doing better than others. Some cities are doing better than others to mobilize power. I, I drive through Johannesburg, I see one park, it's fantastic. I see another park, it's lousy. Mm. Yeah. That's because one community up. has done something, the other community yeah. hasn't done something. Just Leaders wrapping it up because are... we're running out of time, how do we take this discussion forward? What needs to happen to bridge the, the divide between the public and the private sector and get them to work together at a leadership level? You know, the, for me, is, is for, the, for both representatives of the private sector and the political leadership, to look this country objectively and ask themselves the question, are they resolving the fundamental question that divided South Africans in the first place? Which is the question of dispossession, marginalization, and exclusion. 
inequality yeah. and so forth. All right, Paul? And they have to do that together rather than shout at one another over the barricades. Well said. <laughs> <laughs> Let's leave it there for tonight. That's Interface for this week. We're back again next week. Remember, you can always email us, interface on SABC3 at sabc.co.za and also catch us on our Facebook page. Let's continue this discussion then and uh, keep those SMS messages coming through from me, Tembi Samakhele, and the team. Good night. Mm -hmm.